Isaiah 40 is, ooh, there we go, is a book that we've, uh, or a chapter that the last two times I've gotten to preach the word, uh, we've been in Isaiah 40, and it's been a great chapter of talking about just who our great God is. And so I'm looking forward to what the Lord has in store for us. What do you hope happens this year? Or this next year, I should say. It's still 2023. What do you hope it happens in 2024? What sort of re- resolutions do you have planned? Maybe some of you, your only resolution is to not have resolutions. Jonathan Edwards, though, a great American preacher, uh, when he was 18 years old, he started a, a kind of resolution of actually making 70 resolutions from the age of 18 to 19, and they weren't exactly just for uh, that year. These were resolutions that Jonathan Edwards wrote for his lifetime. He uh, actually starts his resolutions not, uh, he, right, right before getting to the 70 resolutions, he starts out though by writing this. He says, being sensible that I am unable to do anything without God's help, I do humbly entreat him by his grace to enable me to keep these resolutions so far as they are agreeable to his will for Christ's sake. So Edwards realized that he uh, needed Christ's strength, divine enablement to accomplish these things. He also wanted to make sure that these resolutions lined up with what God had laid out for his life and ministry there. But Edwards was entranced And you'll see this, he was entranced in his resolutions with the glory of God. What mattered to Jonathan Edwards most was that whatever resolutions he would have from year to year, whatever those might be, what his purpose in life was, was to glorify God. And that really is is what we ought to be seeking as well, and we'll even see that in Isaiah 40. But A.W. Tozer also writes this, what comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. Maybe you know this, this quote from, from memory yourself. What comes into your minds when we think about God is the most important thing even about you. In Isaiah 40, we find one of the greatest chapters in discussing the nature and character of who God is. In verses one and two, God promises that he's going to comfort his people. His wisdom is matchless. His greatness is incomparable. He is like no other in his holiness. And all of this is to address the statement that we find in verse 27. So let's start there in verse 27. All of what happens from verses 1 to 26 is setting the stage for something that God is going to speak against his people in what they've either said said out loud or maybe thought in their own minds. Verse 27 says, Why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord, and my just claim is passed over by my God? For Israel, they knew all these things of who God was. Maybe many of you are in the situation, you've grown up maybe going to Wana or, or going to VBSs, maybe you know God's word in and out, and yet sometimes, even for the person who knows God's word uh, from the front of the Bible to the back cover, we still need to be reminded of these things. We forget very easily. So the response that God gives will be important for us when we encounter times where we face uncertainty, where we forget who God is and what he is like. This past year, you may have experienced a lot of uncertainty, maybe times of failures, weaknesses, wearinesses. Uh, maybe you have at certain times felt like, is, has God abandoned me? What is, what is going on? Um, this next year, uh, you may, and more than likely, all of us in here will face times where we are discouraged, where we have failings and, and weaknesses shown. But even in the midst of all of this, in the midst of your weariness and my weariness, this is what Isaiah is going to close chapter 40, stating, in the midst of your weariness, remember and rest in your all-sufficient God. In the midst of your weariness, remember and rest in your all-sufficient God. In verse 27, God continues to question Israel about these things to remind them of fundamental truths that not only inform them of important truths, but that will actually comfort them in the future of their lives, what God has planned for them. 
And so that is why we, are, we see in verses 27 and 28 how we need to remember God's all-sufficient sovereignty. Remembering his all-sufficient sovereignty. This is a, a passage that's in the middle of a really big book of the Bible. Um, Isaiah's been talking to the people of Judah about how judgment is coming to them. Uh, and they've experienced some of the, the tremors of this judgment in, in when the northern kingdom was facing Assyria, and then Assyria was coming against the nation of, of Judah. And there was a lot of turmoil during that time. And eventually, Isaiah was saying, actually, Babylon will come. And it won't just be a, a few skirmishes here and there. They're actually going to come, and you are going to go into exile. But even after all of that, um, there's, there would be a lot of certainly uh, failures and, and weaknesses displayed. And so you would expect that there would be a lot of people saying, where is God in all of this? Why is God allowing these bad things to happen for me, my family, my nation? Maybe you're in that same boat as well, and you might say along with the, the Jewish exiles, my way is hidden from the Lord, and my just claim is passed over by my God. I, I like what Pastor Ray Ortland writes of these Jewish exiles. He, he says, they seem to have been floating somewhere between a struggling faith and a cynical defiance. Maybe you land in one of those boats this morning, maybe a, a struggling faith, you're not sure what God is doing in your life, or maybe a cynical defiance like, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not surprised, I've, I figured that that would be who, who God is, and, uh, and I, you know, he just hasn't come through for me, and I'm not surprised, because uh, I, I just don't see how God could be all-powerful and, and good at the same time, and yet these things are happening to me. So either way, whether you're struggling in your faith, where you feel like my, my way is hidden from the Lord, or maybe a, a, a cynic, it's God's fault for my, resolu- for, for, for my situation. If God would just rescue me, then, then I'd serve him, but God doesn't fit the way uh, my life uh, is, is feeling at the moment. I don't feel like God is there. But it's interesting that in verse 27, you, you, you see how he says, why do you say, O Jacob? And speak, O Israel. Why does he include those two, those two descriptors for the nation of Israel and Judah? What is so significant about Jacob and Israel? Well, Jacob is the Jewish patriarch who received his new name, Israel, from the Lord after he wrestled with the Lord, clinging to him until God blessed him. And in this fighting to believe and cling to the Lord, is actually the type of, of response that he is wanting from his people, that they would cling to him even in the midst of hardship, amid sufferings, amid the testing of their faith. And that's the same thing that God is wanting for us in the midst of our hardships, in the midst of our sufferings, that we would cling to him, that we would hold on. God's people, sorry, missed my notes. But yeah, so, the, so this is what God is, is even wanting from his people. The people that have turned their backs on him, who, who in thought, word, and deed, they, they had, uh, had gone after idols. They had gone over uh, to, to other nations to, to, to see uh, what, what, what sort of things that they could have from them. And so God is saying, why, why, why do you say and speak in such a way that your way is hidden from the Lord, that your just claim is, is, is like over, it's an oversight on, on God's part. God is saying, no, like, I have actually been there the entire time. You are still God's people. And so God is going to show Israel what they should have known, what they need to understand. And so first off, we even see in verse 28, these are the things that, that they should know about who God is. Verse 28 says, have you not known have you not heard the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, neither faints nor is weary? His understanding is unsearchable. And so, the first thing that we even see about who this sovereign God is, is that he is sovereign in time. He is sovereign in time. Verse 28 says, the everlasting God 
the Lord. God is out spa- outside space and time. And as much as you and I might have our own ideas of how our lives should work, uh, when, when things should happen in our lives, whether it be schooling or career or family planning, whatever the case may be, we have our own ideas of, of what that should look like. But God is the everlasting God. All of time does not revolve around us, but exclusively around who he is. God is outside space and time. Is, so even when we think about our own lives and how it connects with God, is God still good even though this disease has not left me like the, like the doctors said that it might? Is God still looking out for me even if I haven't begun a family at this stage of my life? And I think a lot of times we, we, we think this way of even our own goals, even of our own resolutions. Like, man, in 2024, I really want to see this happen. But while sometimes resolutions, goals, they aren't bad, uh, and sometimes they actually happen in our timetable, most often than not, we, they don't go according to plan. Some, when, when we choose goals or resolutions, we typically don't say, God, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And we, and we say, you know, God, I kind of want you to, you know, plan, all these thing, or plan these things according to my will and to my kingdom. But are we going to be content and faithful in what we have in front of us? So God is sovereign over time. We must also remember his sovereignty over creation. Of, over all creation. In verse 28, he is the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth. So if you can get to the point where you realize it's God who's created everything and then realize that there's nothing that God cannot do. We, we like the children's song, my God is so big, so strong, so mighty, there's nothing that he can't do. There's a couple of parts though in verse 29 that we'll get to. There's a few things that Actually, he can't do. And we'll get to that, though. Just hang, hang on to that point. But this is the same argument, though, that since God is the creator of all, he's, he's sovereign over all. And just like Job in, in his suffering, who is wondering, like, where is God in his suffering? Job 38, 4 says, where, where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. God has a part in in his creation of every single cell and microbe that exists. So part of what we need to understand is that since God has such an interest in every single part of his creation, he certainly takes interest in you and in me. In our fears, in our doubts, in our faintings and weaknesses and distress. Pastor Ray Ortland also says this, quote, There is not a single square inch on this earth unknown to God, or lying beyond the range of his presence. Anywhere life may take us, whether Babylonian exile, or a lonely hotel room, or an intensive care unit, God will already be there for us. We lie in his grace and power at all times, everywhere. What an encouraging statement that is. God is sovereign over creation. These are truths about God that that we need to continue to to remind ourselves about. We need to remember God's all-sufficient sovereignty. God is sovereign over creation. He's also sovereign in his power and might. In showing his power, though, Isaiah writes of two things. Here's what God cannot do. Well, you might say, what is that? Uh, Well, uh, one thing that I, I, I appreciate about even a thing that uh, another pastor I heard say was, be thankful for divine inability. And you're probably thinking like, what is this assistant pastor talking about? Um, so in verse 29, let's go there. Uh, or actually the, the end of verse 28. The creator of the ends of the earth, he neither faints nor is weary. God cannot faint or grow weary. Aren't you thankful for that this morning? That God is not going to fall asleep on your life. My God is so big, so strong, and so mighty, there's actually some things my God cannot do. He neither faints nor is weary. And though God did rest on the seventh day of creation, it wasn't out of necessity, but it was out of intentionality. God does not grow weary. We do. God does not faint. We do. 
The reason we sometimes wonder if God is really able to do what he says that he's going to do is that we see so much of our failures and weaknesses all around us, even in the greatest politicians, in the greatest athletes, the celebrities, even pastors, teachers, parents, yes, and even the greatest of children, bosses, coworkers, all of us have chinks in our armor. We all have vulnerabilities, yet there is none with God. Psalm 18 verse 2 says, The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my strength, and whom I will trust, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. God's to-do lists, God's resolutions always happen. He always keeps those. Though it may feel like in your life, like, is God really keeping his word? Is God really looking out for my benefit? Actually, even in your suffering and your weaknesses and your doubts, in all of that, God's power is not absent. God's will, uh, God will point this out even further in the last phrase of verse 28. He, he neither faints nor is weary, but his understanding is unsearchable. So God is sovereign in power, but he is sovereign also in wisdom. We can't understand all of God's ways. Even later in Isaiah 55, it's going to say, For, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, says the Lord, and my ways are, are not your ways. They are higher than our ways and our thoughts. Sometimes what God is, is, uh, is doing, he doesn't let us know all of what he's doing. Now, we do see in Scripture a lot of things of what he is doing, what he's doing in, in salvation, in, in providing a Savior in Jesus Christ, and how that is playing out even in the church today. You just looked in Ephesians 1 through 3 about all that God is doing for you and for me in the church. And we see God, God's will on full display there. But yet there are some things that even in our individual lives, in our families' lives, in the life of our church and nation that we don't quite know exactly all that's going to take place. What is God doing? We don't always know that. Jeremiah eighteen six says, O house of Israel, can I not do with you as this potter, says the Lord? Look, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand, O house of Israel. So when God allows certain things to happen in your life and in my life, we don't often see God's hand at work. When things go our way, that's, that's typically when, when we're like, oh, yeah, that, that, that was God. Um, but when difficult things happen, we often don't like what we see. Oftentimes, you'll hear the argument, as, as I said earlier, about how if God is all-powerful and all-good, how can a good God, an all-powerful God, uh, allow for suffering and all of that? Well, I can't always give a... a, a an answer that will probably satisfy everyone. But what I can say is that we can know that God is all powerful and all good because he's also all wise. Whatever his purposes might be, and we know a few of those things, but God is doing thousands of things every single moment that you and I are not aware of. And we only see some of them. And even then, that's when we look back on our lives and see God's hand. But in God's sovereignty, he has placed you in the family he's given you and all its imperfections, quirks, strengths, and weaknesses to make you who you are today. But even at, for us as believers, if we look back on our life, whether decades long or even less than a decade, we can know that God has done everything by his all-powerful, all-wise, and always good plan. You are no accident. Do you believe that this morning? That God has created you specifically the way that you are for certain purposes that we may not even be aware of. But if God has guided our footsteps up to this point in time, why would we not trust in his care for us in the future? Do you remember back in Genesis? Obviously, we all, uh, uh, if we've read the book of Genesis, know that the end of Genesis is uh, predominantly the story of Joseph and his, and his family. Now, Joseph was betrayed by his brothers, sold into slavery, into Egypt, and in Potiphar's uh, household, he's falsely accused, put in prison for over two years, and then ascends to, miraculously ascends to the the second in command of 
of, uh, of Pharaoh's household and over the nation. And yet, even after the, he, he confronts his brothers at the end, he says this, but as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring it about as it is this day to save many people alive. So Joseph actually looked and, and was like, yes, that is the reason that I actually went through that tough period, through that time of suffering. God is, is, is very gracious in, in, getting, in allowing us to see those times. But there's actually another biblical character that went through a tough time, and he actually didn't find out exactly why God did, why he did it, or, or what, what he did and why he did it. And that's Job. Job didn't understand exactly why he was suffering. The book of Job doesn't answer that uh, in, in detail. It actually just tells us, this is who your God is is. Do you still trust God even in the midst of suffering? Both Joseph and Job, though, knew and remembered and trusted in God's gracious wisdom. So verses 27 through 28, they, they, they show us how God is our all-sufficient God. He is good and powerful and all-wise. He is all-sovereign. Though he doesn't tell us everything he's doing or going to do in our lives, he's told us one very specific thing in verses 29 through 31 that I think will help us, not just in 2024, but even for the rest of our lives. Not only are we to remember God's all-sufficient sovereignty amid our weariness, but we are called to rest in God's all-sufficient strength. Rest in God's all-sufficient strength. Verse 29 says this, He gives power to the weak, and to those who have no might, he increases strength. Even the youths shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. First, God gives spiritual strength. This is what God is doing. We might say, well, I, I don't know all that God is doing in my life, in the lives of, of believers around me, uh, in, in, in the rest of the world. I don't know exactly all that God is doing, but one thing I can know for sure is that God will give strength to those who are weak. Well, who are the weak in, in this verse? Well, you can just go back to verse 27 and say, these people, these people who, who say, my way is hidden from the Lord and my just claim is passed over by my God. That I don't know what God is doing, Sometimes I feel as though maybe God is absent. Maybe God isn't there. This is who, who God is, is, is talking to here. God gives these people power. It is people without hope, people who are in dire straits. It is you and me when we seek to follow the Lord and realize that the Christian life is, in fact, pretty difficult at times. But... Brothers and sisters, God will give you strength. He will give you strength not just on Sunday, but on Monday too. Has this been a difficult year for you? I'm sure many of us would say, yeah, there have been many difficulties. I, I, I could write a huge list of all that I'm struggling with. Well, if this year has been difficult for you, Christian, God will give you strength still. Do you have doubts about this upcoming year? God will give you strength are you anxious about your present circumstances? God will give you strength. Are you unsure if you can truly reach out to ask for help from a fellow brother or sister in Christ? God will give you strength. Are you unsure if you can really let go of, of the resentment you have toward your spouse or parents for how they've wronged you? God will give you strength. The list could go on and on. But you might say, how does God accomplish this in my life? What, what does this strength even look like? Well, a New Testament passage that I think will help us, uh, not, not, not just this one, we'll, we'll look at a few others, but one that I think is, is really awesome, and I just looked over it this week, is Romans 5, 6. Romans 5, 6 says, For when we were still without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. We are weak sinners, we, we obviously, uh, there, there's, uh, there's different levels of, of, of people who, who have uh, 
been true to their resolution from this past year and you've been working out and, and you've you know been lifting the weights or out running, doing all those things, and, and, and you're you know, good on you. That's not the strength that's being talked about here, though. This is the strength uh, and, and the weakness of, of individual people in, in our inward being, in our inner man, of spiritual strength and spiritual weakness. Be, due to our sin, we actually all stand condemned because of sin. We are all weak because of the fall. And there's our, our, our desire to do what's right is not uh, there in following the Lord, in, in trusting in Jesus. And yet, because of what Jesus has done on the cross, what Jesus has done next in, in, ascent, in rising down from the dead, ascending into heaven, sending his spirit into our hearts when, when, when God causes us to be born again, we now have this strength to live this Christian life. We can be renewed in our minds. We can have our strength renewed. So this is spiritual strength that God is giving us in all of these seasons of life, in all of these ups and downs. This is God's strength. But you might say, well, how can you access this strength? How, how can you get this divine enablement, this grace to help in time of need? Well, it can be accessed, as we see in verses 30 and 31, through waiting on the Lord and resting in him. Even the youths faint and, and grow weary, the young men utterly fall, but those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. This is a promise that you can take to the bank. You can be strengthened by waiting on the Lord, resting in him. This word wait can also be translated a, a few w different ways. If you have an NIV, you, you probably have it as hope, which isn't a, a, a bad uh, tr tr translation of that word. Uh, it's just a different facet of, of this Hebrew term uh, for waiting and resting. Uh, this, this term can include different facets of looking expectantly, trusting God's performer to accomplish what he's promised. But notice what uh, even Isaiah is going to say earlier in chapter 30, verse 15. For thus says the Lord God, the Holy One of Israel, in returning and rest, you shall be saved. So there's this correlation between resting and salvation. In quietness and confidence shall be your strength. We, we sang uh, a song, I will wait for you, from Psalm 130. Verse 5 of that psalm says, I wait for the Lord, my soul waits. And in his word, I do hope. There's countless passages that, that talk about this, this aspect of waiting on God. Waiting and resting and hoping are all parts of this Christian life. There might be times where the Christian life seems like an impossible thing, like there's just so many to-dos and, and whatnot. And it's like, that, you're missing the point of the Christian life. That's, that's not it at all. The Christian life is a call to rest in Jesus, where you're just hoping, you're, you're putting your trust, your patience, even in the midst of difficult circumstances, you are trusting that God is going to fulfill his promises. As we wait on the Lord, our strength is renewed then, and God keeps on refreshing us as we rest in him. But there's a warning, even in verse 30, of trusting in our own abilities, and it actually has a special focus on those, even in this room, who are maybe younger in life. When, uh, for, for young, uh, not, not, not just young men, but, uh, but for youths, even the youths shall faint and be weary and the young men shall utterly fall. For even younger people, there's a tendency to think like, man, I, I feel good, I, I, I'm not, you know, don't have back pain, don't have, you know, knee trouble, whatever the case, and man, I, I, I just feel like I could conquer the world. And so there's even this warning that, you know what? Even youths faint and grow weary. None of us is, is it, even if we go to the gym, you know, five, five days a week and we're just fit as can be, we grow faint and grow weary. It's not about us trying to earn God's favor, of, of trying to, to just be better people to somehow uh, get this strength that God is giving us. 
The way that we get this strength is not about that at all. It's by resting in Jesus. Of course, it's, it's not limited just to young people. Even elderly people, uh, not basically anyone who's, who doesn't feel young. Uh, I'm kind of getting there as, as, as well. We uh, were out on a camping trip, and uh, uh, there was, uh, or not camping, it was a hunting trip, and I didn't see any deer, so it was more like camping for me. But, um, <laughs> but there were a few times where you're sitting in, in, in a tree stand, and you, uh, you get up, and then it's like, wow, that... That really did a number on my back, on my neck, and everything. And, uh, but thankfully, it's not about our, our physical weakness or strength. It's all about resting in God to give us this strength. So I wanted to turn our focus uh, to even the, the New Testament book of 2 Corinthians. We're, we're going to be in uh, chapter 4 and chapter 12. But in 2 Corinthians 4, verse 8, it says, it, it agrees with how life actually looks a lot of the time. We are hard pressed on every side, yet not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. We're persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. Always carrying about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our body. In 2 Corinthians 12, uh, just turning there very quick, you, you might remember this is a passage where Paul admits that there's there's just this one particular thing, this thorn in the flesh. We aren't told exactly what it is, but he, he says, this thing is something that I asked the Lord to just remove from my life, uh, whether it was a, a physical thing or maybe something that uh, it was this persecution. Uh, we don't exactly know, but this is his response in verse eight. Concerning this thing, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. And in going back to 2 Corinthians 4.16, therefore, and this is one of the most remarkable parts of, of the Christian life, we don't lose heart, even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. So Christians ought to be some of the most peculiar people, because not... Not, not because we're, we're, we're like, yay, suffering, but because even despite outer afflictions, despite painful circumstances, that those things don't have the final say on our lives. We realize that these light momentary afflictions pale in comparison to knowing and savoring our all-sufficient God. So even when I'm not always exactly sure what God is doing in my pain and my suffering, I can rest in him and I am looking expectantly for how he'll use these afflictions and these weaknesses to actually show strength through my life and also advance his kingdom purposes. So how does this work into daily life? Am I just sitting around twiddling my, thrum, my, my, my thumbs, just waiting like, you know, okay, God's going to do it. I need to sit back, let go, and let God, right? No, that's, that's not what true waiting and resting looks like. It's actually pursuing Jesus, pursuing a person, counting all things as lost so that we gain Christ. The, the, the things in, in this world, many of these are, are wonderful things, but they are not going to last. Many times we feel like the people in verse 27 do because we're actually living more for the things in this world rather than living for Christ's kingdom. There's no spiritual strength found in living for ourselves. So, what is this new year going to look like for you? In your resolution making or your non-resolution making, I hope that at least one resolution you'll make is that you will yield to Christ this year. Yielding every aspect of your life, everything that, that you do in your life is living in the presence of this sovereign God. You may be here and, and you have no idea what it means to live the Christian life. Uh, you may be here and you might say, you know, I, I'm living for myself. I'm not, a, I'm not a believer. I would even just go back to what the passage says in Romans 5, 6. Even in our weakness, when we were still without strength, in due time, Christ died for you. He died for us. He died for all of us. 
Becoming a Christian doesn't mean difficulty won't go away, but we're promised by our all-sufficient God that he will give us strength. He, he'll give us strength to save us uh, from, from our sin in the present so that your sin is gone, that his forgiveness will cover it all. He will give us strength. And then in our Christian lives, he will give us strength to continue to pursue him day in and day out. And so that one day, when we die, we will live in heaven with him forever. For the believers, uh, for, for us, as we are li living this Christian life, part of the waiting and resting will actually avail be availing ourselves of God's means of grace, God's means of strength that he's given us in the scriptures, in praying to him, in, in fellowshipping with other believers, in, in taking the, this, this next year to maybe spend more time in praying with other believers. Um, the, there's so many different ways that God has, has given for strategies for, for actually growing and waiting and resting on him. And so, with all of this being said, our only hope for our times of weariness and weakness must be to remember and rest in our all-sufficient God. When we submit to what God is doing in the world, and more importantly in our own lives, we'll discover that God is all we need. He is all-sufficient. I'll close with, uh, with uh, mentioning one of Jonathan Edwards' resolutions uh, for not only his year, but his life. He says in resolution number 53, resolved to improve every opportunity when I am in the best and happiest frame of mind. And I don't think he was just talking about when he was, you know, happy, go lucky, but in, in all times when, when, when the Lord allowed him to think on the things of, of, of Christ, when I am in the best and happiest frame of mind to cast and venture my soul on the Lord Jesus Christ to trust and confide in him and consecrate myself wholly to him that from this I may have assurance of my safety, knowing that I confide in my Redeemer. We need to rest. We need to remember our all-sufficient God. Let's close with a word of prayer, and then we'll sing one more song this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you can do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. This power is not intrinsic in who we are. It's not based on our own ability or, or our, own, uh, our own goodness, our own righteousness, to be able to be uh, strong enough to please you, but you actually are the one who makes us strong. In our weakness, you have sent Jesus to die on the cross for us. We thank you for who Jesus is in his death, his resurrection, and how he now sits at your right hand, interceding for us so that we can go to your throne anytime and ask for this divine enablement, this strength for our lives. We thank you for the promises of Isaiah 40 and just such a powerful uh, text that, that talks about uh, you and your nature and how we fit into this, this world. We thank you for these truths. Help us as we leave here today that we would find strength by resting in you. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen.